Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors, endless stories. Friends in Fiction is a Facebook Live program with five best-selling novelists whose common love of reading, writing, and independent bookstores bound them together with chats, author interviews, and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Best-selling novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. At the start of the pandemic, they got together for a virtual happy hour to talk about their books, their favorite bookstores, writing, reading, and publishing in this new uncharted territory. They're still talking, and they've added fascinating discussions with other best-selling novelists. So join them live on their Friends and Fiction Facebook group page every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, or listen and view later at your leisure on their podcast or on their website at www.friendsandfiction.com. Hi, everyone. And welcome, Hi. welcome to Friends in Fiction, our <laughs> weekly Facebook live show featuring author chats in support of independent bookstores. We are so happy you're here for this really special show. We have so much tonight and we cannot wait to just jump right in. I'm hosting tonight and I am Patty Callahan Henry and my next book is Surviving Savannah out on March 9th. And hello, I'm Mary Alice Monroe, and my upcoming book is May 11th, and it's called The Summer of Lost and Found. I'm Mary Kay Andrews, and the newcomers will be out May 4th. Hi, I'm Kristen Harmel, and my next book is The Forest of Vanishing Stars, coming July 6th. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and my next book is Under the Southern Sky, releasing April 20th. And this is Friends in Fiction. Welcome. Not only do we have one amazing guest tonight, but two. I don't know how we got double lucky, but we did, and so did you. But before we talk about our guests and then talk to our guests, we get to do one of our very favorite things at Friends in Fiction. One of our own has a cover reveal. Yay! The truth is we've seen it already because we made her show us. <laughs> but Kristen, do not keep it from everyone else for one more second. Ready? Yay! So thank you, Patty. Yay! Yay! Bravo, bravo. Yay! I love it. So I much. got chills I'm, again. It's so pretty. I, I love it. I love it too. I love it too. So I'm so excited about this one. Um, I pitched it as Where the Crawdads Sing meets Rapunzel set in World War II, which sounds kind of <laughs> nuts. But basically, it's based on the true story of Jews in Poland who escaped the Nazis by disappearing deep into the dark forests. Um, the story centers on a young woman named Yona who was kidnapped by a crazy old woman when she was just a baby and raised alone in the wilderness in total isolation. But after the woman dies in 1942, this old kidnapper, um, Yona soon encounters a family of fleeing Jewish refugees, changing her life forever. But soon she learns that you can't run from your past. So I seriously cannot wait to share this book with all of you. And of course, you can pre-order it now if you're interested from wherever books are sold, including our bookstore of the week, Parnassus Books. And anyone who pre-orders from Parnassus by Saturday night will receive one of these awesome friends and fiction koozies. The link is under announcements. So there you go, friends and fiction. I'd like to raise a toast to the forest of vanishing stars. Oh, Cheers. Cheers. To the forest of vanishing stars. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> So we have listened to Kristen talk about this book as she mm -hmm. sprinted to the end of it. And I have to tell you, her immaculate research uh -huh. and the synchronicities that happened to her mm -hmm. that turned this book idea into a powerful novel, y'all are, y'all, we cannot wait. But it. wait, speaking of Kristen, <laughs> hello, finalist for the Goodreads historical fiction category. <laughs> we are so proud. You haven't voted. So 
Go vote. Oh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. I and know you- everyone's tired of voting, <laughs> but go vote. Go vote. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. And if you voted in one of the previous rounds, you can vote again. So you can vote each round, but this is the last one. So thank you. We want you to win, win, win. Thank- wouldn't that be awesome to kind of bring it home for friends and fiction? Yeah, okay. cool. yeah, this is when your vote like really counts. So yeah. Yeah. One thank more you, time. thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, enough Kristen. Thank you. <laughs> never, there's thank never you. enough Kristen. Never I'm enough. very <laughs> proud. It's thank kind you. of like we feel like it's we're it's a win for all of us. Aw, thank you. you. But we are all truly a team and truly sisters. And so that means a lot. Thank you. Yep. We're we proud. Are. Okay, so now let me tell you about our bookstore for the week. As you know, one of our founding principles was to support indie booksellers. Mm -hmm. And tonight we're spotlighting, spotlighting, that's a tongue twister, spotlight, spotlighting, (laughs) spotlighting Parnassus Bookstore. It is one of my favorite places to visit. And Parnassus is located in Nashville, Tennessee, and founded and run by the beloved author Ann Patchett. This week, they're offering a 10% discount on books by our guests, as well as the five of us, with the code FRIENDSFICTION10. There's no and in there, just FRIENDSFICTION10. And also, as Kristen mentioned, anyone who pre-orders from Parnassus gets one of those little koozies, and Kristen will send that to you. And Parnassus actually has a separate page set up for Kristen, so we'll put it on the Friends and Fiction page. Um, Finally, phew, let me tell you about our guest tonight, JT Ellison and Hank Felipe Ryan. We are so happy to have them. We have been looking forward to this for so long. They are both huge best-selling authors of thrillers, and this is crazy, but they are both Emmy Award winners also. And they are both kind and smart and interesting. Yes, they are both all of those things. So talking about their bios would leave no time to talk to them. So I'm gonna make this really quick. (laughs) JT Ellison is the New York Times and USA Today bestselling author of more than 20 acclaimed novels, including Tear Me Apart, Lie to Me, and All the Pretty Girls. She also co-authored the huge blockbusters with Catherine Coulter, a Brit in the FBI. She is the, as I mentioned, Emmy award-winning co-host of the television series a word on words in Nashville, Tennessee. With millions of books in print, Ellison's work has been published in 27 countries and 15 languages. She was once an appointee and worked in the White House. I ask her questions about that all the time. And for several defense and aerospace contractors. After moving to Nashville, Ellison began to research her hidden passions, forensics and crime, and was compelled to begin writing her stories. JT's interests go way beyond writing books. She also publishes them. In 2015, Ellison founded her own indie publishing house, Two Tales Press. She lives with her husband and twin kittens in Nashville, where she enjoys fine wine and good notebooks. Her new novel, Her Dark Lies, is coming out next year on the same pub date as Surviving Savannah, March 9th, and it is page turning glorious. Hank Felipe Ryan is the USA Today bestselling author of 12 thrillers. Her newest book is The First to Lie and came out like the rest of our books in the middle of the pandemic. Hank Felipe Ryan is the USA Today bestselling author. She has won multiple awards for her thrillers, five Agathas, four Anthonys, the Daphne, two McCavities, and the Coveted Mary Higgins Clark Award. She is also, oh my gosh, the on-air <laughs> investigative reporter for Boston's TV. She has won 37 Emmys, 14 more awards, and dozens of other honors. National book reviews have called Hank a master crafting suspenseful stories and a superb and gifted storyteller. Her 2019 book is the acclaimed standalone psychological thriller, The Murder List, which mm-hmm. just won the Anthony Award. Her newest book is The First to Lie, a chilling psychological standalone. She lives in Boston, Massachusetts. So without further ado, let's bring the ladies from the green room. Yay! 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 Oh. Well, How was the champagne brown. and m and back there? Jake so good. all the appetizers. I had to get some from her. You know, but then she hid the champagne, so we finally oh, shared. Okay. I, I, I made her give me an advanced copy of Her Dark Lies because I want her Amazing. to tell the 10-word 
description of that book because it is the best idea I have ever heard. Oh, we're wow. we're going to make her wow. tell us. It's amazing. <laughs> I know. Okay. So welcome y'all. What a few weeks this has been. I mean, let's be honest, what a year it's been. Um, this week for our newsletter, I wrote an essay called The Flim Flam Hustle Myth and talked about, are we pushing too hard sometimes? Where do we find balance? When the creative ideas are flowing, do we want to do everything all at once? And one of my favorite comments that I don't know who to attribute it to is, you can be anything, but you can't be everything. Uh -huh. So how do we choose? So JT and Hank, when we look at your body of work, it is obvious that you hustle, but you have full and beautiful lives at the same time. So tell me how you choose. How do you do anything, although you can do everything? JT? <laughs> I suffer from that exact thing, trying to decide what am I going to do, what's important, what is what is vital. Um, my rule is to try to keep it 90% writing and 10% business. And I can, ah. I can always tell when I start getting out of balance, when I start getting into 50-50 or even like this week, it's been completely swapped. I haven't written a word, but I've done a ton of business. That's when I have to step back and say, nope, definitely going to uh, try to fix this and, and, and get back to the work because that's the only thing that really matters for what we're doing mm. as creatives, as writers. That's, that's, our, that's our job is to write. And I don't think there's an editor on the planet that's going to be calling you saying, hey, you didn't spend enough time on, on, on Twitter today. I didn't see yeah. the posts from you. You know, that's, it's, so that's, I always try to remember that when I start getting out of balance, that my job is to be a writer, and, and that's the priority, and, and that, that helps. So, JT, I think your microphone is, there you go. There's like a weird oh, staticky hey, thing. There you go. You it. Yeah, it. magic. Much better. Magic. But that was amazing advice. The 90-10 rule. I haven't heard that. I've never been able to manage that. Oh, now I can't. Now That's I can't amazing. Hear her, though. Now you can't. Now we can't hear you at all. Uh -huh. But Hank, Hank, how do you do anything? Although you can do everything, and we know you can. We just read your awards. <laughs> because I used to try, I used to be a real multitasker and I would, okay. I would do a little bit of this and do a little bit of this. And I think I could talk on the phone and do my email at the same time and think about stuff and take notes. And I have realized that the thing, the way to, one way to handle my life is to just do one thing at a time, to focus uh, on yeah. the one thing. So um, I have, I'm so organized. I have lists of lists. I have a, I, I can't use a calendar because there's not much, not enough room. So I have a <laughs> notebook that says Tuesday, the 19th or whatever day it is, because who knows what day it is anyway. Who knows? Who and knows? I list the things that I have to do and I cross them off. I do one thing at a time. I'm fully present in the thing that I'm doing. And I don't worry about that. I'm not doing this and I'm not doing that. I think about I that. Am doing the task that I am doing. I will complete the task that I have um, designed to do, that I've assigned myself to do, and then I'll go on to the next one. It's just like a little kid. It's terrible. Yeah. Sometimes when I'm writing, you know, I, I carve out the time for my writing and I protect that, you know, mm -hmm. from two to five or two to six. Those are my yeah. prime writing times. And I and I and I don't let anything interfere with that. That's my promise that I've made to myself. You know, when we're in our real jobs, other jobs, and we have a boss, and we're trying to please the boss. Well, I'm the boss now. I'm yeah. the boss of my writing now, and I do what pleases myself. But as I said, it's like a little kid. I I actually I'll tell you this. I actually set a timer. And I, I say to myself, I'm going to, it's really 34 minute increments. I write for 34 minute increments and I do not check the email. I do not go out and see if any mail has arrived. I don't do the laundry. I don't do, wow. do anything else except for write. And when the bell dings, I'm often so deeply into the manuscript at that point um, that I just set it again and go again. But it's a question of wow. focus. That's my key is to focus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm taking that home with me. How about you ladies? How do you do anything, although I bet you can do everything? How do you decide, Mary Kay? 
I think I, when I go to bed at night, the last thing I try to think about is what I'm going to do in the morning. And, uh -huh. and for the past uh, uh -huh. eight or nine months, what I'm going to do in the morning is write. Yeah. First thing before yeah. anything else happens. And then I think about, well, what has to happen today? I've got to, you know, run errands or do something with the house or, you know, respond to emails or all that kind of stuff. I, I never feel like I have it figured out. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. How about you, Mary Alice? How do you do anything? How do you decide which to do when you could do everything? Well, I'm listening to all of you, first of all. Um, I think in the last week, I have turned off the news. I, I, mm, I, I, that's helpful. I it's been a time suck. And so I also read in our, if anyone hasn't subscribed to our newsletter, um, it's a really great newsletter. Patty, you wrote a really wonderful essay. Oh, and a line you. that I really loved was, what makes us happy isn't doing more, but doing what matters. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really becoming key, you know, especially now that the news is off and all, we can all get back to our normal lives a little bit. Yeah. Um, doing what matters is it's going to keep us productive. It keeps yep. us happy. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Mary Alice. Yeah. So how about you, Kristen? Well, you know, um, doing what matters is such an important thing to think about. It, so that was such a great point, Mary yeah. Alice. And for me, I think my biggest struggle has been trying to figure out what are the things that matter? Because I, I can't do it all. I, I mean, I, I think I think none of us can. We would love to do it all, but there aren't enough hours in the day. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I was thinking about this today, and I think I've really started asking myself the question: Is this thing that I'm going to do something that'll make a better future for, like, for oh, me, for like my that. family, for my work? Mm -hmm. And and you know, I, that doesn't mean that I can't sit on the couch for an hour and watch The Crown because you know what? That's going to make me a little happier, which makes for <laughs> yeah. better future. But, you know, I, I think um, I think just asking what makes for a better future, which includes playing with my son as much as I can too. Oh, I love that. <laughs> How about you, Christy? Um, I feel like I'm probably not the only person in this group who could say this, but um, I really have to think more about, you know, the the having fun and the letting go, because I mean, I am a massive workaholic. I think we probably all we are. are. Yeah, I like are. to be working. I feel like I'm good when I'm working. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like that's kind of like the, the easy stuff. So, um, I mean, I think my major things are just really trying. I can't do it every day because, you know, there's a lot going on, but I really do try to like be the person that picks Will up from school and have the afternoons with him. And that's really important. Um, I also, I just started playing tennis again during COVID and I'm so proud of myself because for years and years and years and years, I've been like, I'm going to start playing tennis again. And then I'm always like, I don't have time. I don't have time. So I found this group of ladies that wants to play for one hour twice a week. And I'm like, if I cannot play tennis for one hour twice a week, I don't have a life. Like I'm out of balance. <laughs> Yeah. Like, I need to be able to do this. And it's been so great. Every time I do it, I'm like, oh, my gosh. I feel like I just did something so amazing. I, and I'm free. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. <laughs> That's awesome. So the five of us the week before this all got to see each other, but we didn't get to see each other this week. But we did get to hang out together this week at a two-day extravaganza on reading with Robin. Oh. So if you shoot over to her Facebook page, you get to see that. Now, JT and Hank, we wonder about your newest books. JT, tell us about Good Girls Lie, a page-turning, plot-twisting, heck of a read. Tell us about <laughs> it. Let's make sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. We, can hear okay. yeah, yeah. we fixed it. Um, so Good Girls Lie is, it's the book that I wasn't supposed to write. I was supposed to be actually taking a break. I was exhausted. I had written a number of books very quickly, and I just wanted a break. And I sat down at dinner with my publisher and my editor and told them I was going to take four months off, to which they were thrilled to hear that news. I'm sure. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, I, I walked out of that and I was like, Ugh, that didn't go so well. <laughs> so maybe, maybe I need to not take a break. Um, and what could I do fast? Because I was, I was, I had a very short deadline. If I was going to write a book, I needed to write something that I could spit out really quickly. And that meant not a lot of research. And Good Girls Lie is set in an all girls private boarding school. And I went to a private boarding college 
all women. And so I knew the setting very, very intimately. I had a number of very weird, creepy stories. The place was haunted, all these fun things. Mm. And I figured, okay, um, I've got three quarters of it. I've got a setting. I know all the research. I just need some characters and a plot. And <laughs> just that, <laughs> just, just that. that. Just that. So I was, I was actually, we were flying to England and I was reading Yoga Journal and, and there was a whole story about this woman and her best friend's name was Ashlyn. And I went, ooh, Ash, Ashlyn. I like that name. And the next page was about Belinda Carlisle, the Go-Go's singer, who is now a yogi, which is awesome. And I'm like, Ash Carlisle, I've got a character. <laughs> Okay. And then we were in Oxford in a coffee shop or in a tea shop. And I'm like, okay, well, maybe she comes from Oxford. And, and then I had the character. By the time I got back, so this is about a week and a half later from when I told them I wasn't going to do a book. About a week and a half later, I had pulled together a, a whole story about Ash Carlisle, who is this young woman from Oxford who's just lost her parents in a terrible murder-suicide. And before they died, they had arranged for her to go to the good school in Marchburg, Virginia. And she doesn't want, you know, she's got nothing. She has nowhere to go. So she has to go to this school. She just wants to fit in. She just wants to live her life. And everything is going pretty well until students start to die. <sighs> That's there amazing. you go. And then, and then, and then. And then. And that's all you get. That's all wow. you get. Wow. Good wow. Open. I love it. Great so, Hank, tell us about the first. I love that both of you have the word lie. Good girls lie and the first to lie. Well, you know, and, that, I thought, we thought you were having a theme. <laughs> it's, a lie. it's the lying Emmy Award winning best selling theme. Yeah. So, <laughs> you like it? So Hank, I know that this book has a really interesting origin story. So tell us about it. Well, you, quickly, I've been a television reporter for 43 years, which is so wow. crazy to think about. And I've wired myself with hidden cameras and confronted corrupt politicians and gone undercover and in disguise. And it was one of the stories that I went undercover mm -hmm. for that's, that really was the germ of this novel. I went undercover to a doctor's office. You, you would not have recognized me with my hair on top of my head and no makeup and big glasses. And I wore like three sweatshirts. So I would, you know, have a different body shape. And over one of the, over the sweatshirt was a work shirt. And in the button of the work shirt was no, in the buttonhole of a work shirt, it was not a button. It was a camera lens, a hidden camera. Wow. And snaked wow. down under that sweatshirt was the wire of the hidden camera, which was attached to the guts of the camera in a fanny pack I was glamorously wearing. <laughs> Well, and my producer and I, who was a man at the time, posed as a woman who wanted to get pregnant and her husband. He didn't have to dress up because he just looks like Chris. Uh, <laughs> to see if doctors would tell us the truth about their malpractice histories. And long story short, they did not. And I got it all on camera. Um, and we wow. did a big story about how doctors were lying about the, their malpractice histories. And a new wow. law was passed in Massachusetts as a result of that to make wow. those histories be in their public record. So that's really good. But oh, I want to read that. Out of that story came the first to lie. And here's what it was. I, wow. you know, he, he lied to me for himself, for selfish reasons, to get me to be a patient. Um, and that's bad. But I lied to him too, didn't I? I lied to him. I didn't say, oh, I'm Hank Philip Ryan from Channel 7. I'm seeing if you're going to tell me the truth. <laughs> right? No, I lied. But I lied for a good reason. I became someone else to get what I want. And that was the par partial key of the book. What if being someone else could get you what you want? So really quickly, you know, it's impossible to talk about a book, a thriller, without giving it away, although JT did a pretty great, fabulous <laughs> job of it. But somebody said to me, tell me about your book in four words. And I said, betrayal, motherhood, obsession, and revenge. So, and then in five phrases, it's um, a devastating childhood betrayal, an undercover reporter who's in too deep, a beautiful sailboat on the Chesapeake Bay, a oh. rich and powerful family, and an ice pick 
that is not used for ice. So two two smart women facing off in a high stakes psychological cat and mouse game to get revenge for a childhood betrayal. But which woman is the cat? And which woman is the mouse? Ooh, I love it. That sounds awesome. That sounds amazing. So Christy Woodson Harvey, I know that you have a question for them. I do. So this is actually for both Hank and JT. So both of you had amazing jobs before you started writing novels. JT, you worked in the White House and Hank, you were and still are a TV anchor. Um, So what made you finally take pen to paper? JT, do you want to start? I was, the White House, the political stuff was the second career. I thought I was going to be a writer and I got a degree in writing and thought I was going to go and get my MFA and and all of that. And my thesis advisors told me I wasn't good enough to get published. Oh, so I got to quit writing. Oh. And she was very adamant. It wasn't a, it wasn't a incentivize her to go and try harder. No, she was very, very serious. She was trying to save me a lot of heartache. And so I went the political route and got my master's in political management and worked in the White House and all over the Hill and all of those things. Uh, it was it was wonderful and it was a lot of fun. I was a glorified tea maker. I mean, you know, come on, I was 21, but it was very fun. And, and it, it, you know, it teaches you a lot of things. But I then I was never happy. I never liked it. I chafed, you know, every time somebody told me to do something, I chafed every time I got in trouble because I got in trouble all the time because I didn't like what I was doing. You know, it just was very difficult for me. I don't play well with others, especially authority figures. Um, And and eventually it became very clear that I was not destined for a life um, with a boss. And I didn't really have much of a choice but to try being a writer again. And, and I did, and it was eight years later and I typed that first paragraph and I just burst into tears because I was home. After all that time, I was finally home. And, you know, it's, you know, at the time I probably wasn't good enough to get published. That's, I mean, I who of us, but really like what, who of us at 21 was like ready to like write a great book? You know, yeah. I mean, you have right. to practice a little bit. It's not like day one. I mean, I'm I, I I'm sure that there are people who do. Oh, there's one some. There. Yeah, but you know, for yeah. a lot of us, it takes more than your it's thesis. Yeah. 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 Oh, which was, goodness. you know, uh, yeah. Well, they 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 were trying to train me to write a certain way. Right. And oh, so you I, I literally have a paper here in my filing cabinet that the the note says reads too much like B grade detective fiction. Huh. Wow. I was writing crime fiction. <laughs> exactly. I was writing crime fiction then, and they didn't want crime That's fiction. They wanted to I know it. No, I just honestly think some people, including professors, think that to critique means you have to make a critical negative mm-hmm. comment. Mm-hmm. And I, that's how they, and I, that's so naive and so wrong. Mm-hmm. I, I hurt for you. <laughs> yeah. That's awful. Well, Hank, what about, but, but you made it. You got the last You're laugh, there. Jamie. Yeah. Oh, sure. Sure. Oh, she didn't get laugh. tenure, so whatever. <laughs> Does she know you're published? I have no idea. I have no yeah, idea. I, I looked her up once on when I had my first book and saw she didn't get tenure, and I, I figured karma took care of it. <laughs> Good for you. Okay. Hank, what about you? Oh, gosh. You know, I, I grew up in really rural Indiana, so rural that you couldn't see another house from our house. And my sister and I used to ride our ponies to the library to get books, and we'd read up in the hayloft of the barn behind our house. Oh, my God. And, that sounds romantic. I, well, was, well, you know what it was, though? It was lonely. It was I was such a loner, such a geeky little bookish little girl that I was voted in my middle school most individual, which meant like weirdest. I mean, they put my picture in the school no. paper upside down because I was <laughs> just, just because I was so weird and so unpopular and so friendless, and I was so upset by that. And I promise you, this has a point. Hey. I, I was so I can't imagine this. That's horrible. Oh. Can you imagine doing that? I mean, it, it, I was sobbing. I went home and I was so upset. I'm like 14, upset as only a 14 year old girl can be like, yeah. I'm gonna, they can't do this to me. Um, and I, and my mom said, you know, I was saying the world isn't fair. The world isn't fair. Mm-hmm. And my mom said, listen, kiddo, 
you're going to have to get over this and you're going to have to learn that the world isn't fair. And I decided mm -hmm. then that when I grew up, I was going to do something to make the world more fair, you know, to stand up for the little guy and make a difference and have my life have some meaning. So I went to the biggest, after working in politics for a couple of years, actually like JT, um, but no candidate I ever worked for actually won. <laughs> so wow. This is not my career. Um, <laughs> the radio station in Indianapolis. And I said, I'm here to apply for a job. Um, this was 1970 and I was 20. And the news director says, um, have you ever worked in radio before? And long story short, I had worked on uh, no television, no radio, no magazine, no anything. I hadn't done anything. So he said, finally says, can you give me one good reason why I should hire you? And I said, um, well, your license is up for renewal at the Federal Communication Commission right now, and you don't have any women working here. My first job in broadcasting. So here's the thing though. I was brave that day. I walked into that, you know, I walked into that. Right. Let me put it this way. Threatening a potential boss with a lawsuit during the job interview <laughs> is not the way to go. I do not recommend this. Um, but I took a chance and I found my calling. You know, I've been you a reporter. actually thought out of the box and you gave an answer that implied you could do investigative journalism. Well, do you think, Mary Alice? I, I, yeah. maybe, maybe so. Um, but I was brave, you know, I was naive, you know, and super confident at 20, we think we can do anything. And I always think about that, how brave I was to take a chance like that. And that's sort of why, how I started writing at age 55, I had a good idea for a book and I just thought I'm doing this, I'm doing hey, this. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> good for you. That's amazing. That's, that's amazing. amazing. Well, well, because we right now you look like about that. 30, so that's a little confusing. I know. It's perplexing. So, Mary Alice, I know you had a question for both of them. I do. Um, both of you write thrillers and are TV hosts. So I think with that background being similar, I'm curious. This is a question we ask all our guests every week. And so with your similar backgrounds, even in politics, yeah. I wonder if your answers would be same or different. What were the values around reading and writing in your house growing up? And how do you think it affected the books that you write today? Go ahead, JT. I was going to say, Hank, you get to go first this time. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, <laughs> do you want me to repeat? I can repeat. No, they got it. No, oh, I got it. Okay. I, um, my parents are huge readers. They, I think they're watching. Hi. Oh. <laughs> um, uh -huh. I sent I sent them the link so they would watch. Uh, they are they're obviously big fans of my work too, which is great. Oh. But my mom, <laughs> they, um, the rule in the house was if I could reach it on the bookshelf, I could read it. Oh. And I was a really tall kid, oh. <laughs> which helped. So I read things I probably shouldn't have read when I was very, very young. Um, I was a very precocious reader. I read fast. They encouraged that. They took me to the library. We made a deal with the librarians because we lived out in the woods. So going to the library was was kind of a chore. And, and so we made a deal with the librarians that I could check out more books than uh -huh. everybody else could because I read so fast, which uh -huh. was fantastic. So uh -huh. it truly comes from my family and my parents absolute love and encouragement when it comes to books and bookshelves. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. I still, I, I share an account with my dad and my mom on, on Kindle so that I can buy books mm -hmm. for them that we can both read at the same time and, and then talk about it. And, oh, you know, wow. we've got book of the month. We, you know, my mom's always calling, okay, which book are you getting? Okay, I'm going to get this one. Oh, you get this nice. one. Swap. I mean, it's it's mm -hmm. really in their mid 80s. And, and it's fantastic that we still have this reading relationship. Mm -hmm. It's never changed. It's wonderful. That's lovely. Thanks, mom and dad. Oh, you're making me miss my mom. <laughs> oh. um, she was so happy oh. when I wrote a book. You know, she, um, I'm so happy that she was alive long enough to see that. You know, I, I, I think she was, and she was the one who, she was the person in my life who would say, I would say, I got an A, and she'd say, not an A plus. <laughs> so um, writing a book was a big deal for us. I, 
I could, I could, I was allowed to read anything in the house. I mean, it was the, my parents' library was full of books. Um, they had, they did not care what I read. They were more upset that I read Mad Magazine than they were <laughs> that I read Marjorie Morningstar. You know, it was that. Oh, wow. Kind of yeah. But that's an interesting yeah. comment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But you know, the Mushroom Planet and Trixie Belden and yeah. you know, all James Thurber's short stories and fables, and you know, every you know, all the books about smart girls that were powerful and that took control. Um, I really loved I really loved those books. And I and I remember tearing through books like JT, reading as fast as I possibly could until I got to Black Beauty, and I don't remember how old I was. Oh, wow. Nine. Yeah. Could that be? And I remember I closed the book, and usually I would close the book and then read something else real fast. And I closed the book, and I re got ready to pick up another book, and I thought, wait, I don't think this is only about a horse. You know, I think oh. there's a more to this book than that. And at that age, I had discovered theme, I, I guess, oh, that there wow. could be more to a book than just the story. I mean, I just mm. got from remembering that. And yeah. I've got that right now. the past. Yeah, thank you. We all have to be readers to be writers, right? We, this is our, what yeah. connects us in life. Yeah. I love point. that. I remember that wow. moment for me. Like I remember that being like, oh wait, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. just bigger than me. Yeah. yeah. Bigger wow. than me. And and writing, writing too, that's what happens in writing too. When you're when we're writing our books and we think we're writing a story. And then at some point we think, oh, this is about a thing, you yeah. know, yeah. the theme. Yeah. Somebody said it was like dropping a drop of iodine into a glass of clear water. When you get the theme, yeah. the color of the whole it just yeah. color. Yes. Oh, what a wow! Yeah, that's a great image. Hi, yeah. Yeah. Are you gonna come say hi? Come on. Wow! Come on. Yeah, you're getting a lot of cat love on the Facebook right now. I, I heard so, that. Yeah. So if you want, if you want to she's, show a cat, you should do it. Um, Kristen, I know you have a question for JT Can while you? she's showing the kitty to all of us. Yeah, so uh, JT, Patty mentioned to me that every book you write has a line that actually defines the book, a yeah. single sentence that sort of encapsulates the story, such as the line, they thought having a baby would fix everything in lie to me, or there are truths and there are lies and there is everything in between, which is where you and I will meet. I love that line Ooh, in, so good. In, in Good Girls Lie. What a great line. So I love that idea. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Does the line come first? Do you put it in afterwards once you have a sense of the story? And is it part of your whole process? It's definitely part of the process. It's something that, you know, a line like that will sit with me for two, three books sometimes until I can oh. finally have that moment that it it's like, yeah. oh, that's what this story is about. The, uh, they thought having a baby would fix everything. He thought having a baby would fix everything that from lie to me. That was with me for probably five years oh. before I actually had the story wow. for it. Wow. Um, Good Girls Lie though, that one happened as I was writing it. So sometimes they are out there waiting for me to start a story and sometimes the story comes from the line it, it just depends but i have found thematically with all of my standalones there is that line that really kind of encapsulates it's not the log line it's not you know it's just more what the story is what the narrative is to me as a writer and that's what i hang my hat on and once i have that then you know i know i've got something that's awesome it becomes and real it, and the line's always in the book. Like, it's not just something that, that you're thinking through. Like, it actually always appears in the book. Yeah. And a lot of times it's title related. You know, okay. it'll it'll have something to do with the title. I, I like to title before I start the story. Okay. And I have now, you know, this many books in learned that, you know, title is, is not something that is necessarily going to stay. Yeah. So having that thematic yeah. line in there, that the chances of that sticking around are, are a lot. That's awesome. I've never heard that before. What a great way to do that. 
Mm. It's like the sourdough right. starter, isn't it? Yeah. I have never thought of that. It grows. I grows. bet if you think about, think about it, you have that. I, I was going to say, I've never thought about that. it, but I can tell yeah. you what the line is in every single book I've written. I can oh, tell that's you what the line is. Oh that's my gosh, nuts. so can I. That's, not, that's crazy. That's like a, I, see, you know, when we were joking earlier about y'all giving the writing tips for yeah. us, that it's the truth because I've never thought of that. That's yep. genius. Yeah, like, where am I? You're all genius. You're all geniuses. <laughs> <laughs> we should go through and um, go through our new books and find what that one line is oh, and post it. Good point. Yeah. yeah, good thinking. But they okay, say Mary you Kay. Be able to find the line of the motivation for your protagonist in it. What is the one line you should be able to point to it that mm. your character wants in the first couple oh. chapters? That's beautiful. Uh -oh. No, it's yeah. funny too. Me, you should get your readers to read your books and have them Ooh. you know, ah. show you the line. That's even better, Hank, because if yeah. they can't figure it out, then oh, it no. isn't clear. <laughs> you, oh, you, the mm -hmm. you know, the title that gives me a little anxiety, Hank. I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, the title for the first to lie, as a matter of fact, came from my book, The Murder List. Which is which is hilarious oh. because oh. in the murder list, um, one of the main characters is talking to a police officer about somebody who was arrested, and the police officer says, "Well, you know, the first to talk is the first to walk, meaning you know, the first to rat out the uh, his wow. companion is the first one to get the lo the lighter sentence." And my character in the book says, "Yeah, but what about the first to lie?" And then I thought, oh, Ooh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. So my title came from a fictional character <laughs> who I wrote. That's so I love funny. It. That's happened very before. Meta. Awesome. Very yeah. meta. Mary very Kay, cool. you had a question for Hank, too. I do, Hank. I know that you were close friends with the late, amazing Sue Grafton. Oh. And, you know, Sue meant a lot to me early in my career as a mystery writer, too. I went to, uh, when I was still a newspaper reporter, I went to a writer's workshop where she was teaching and she was amazingly encouraging to me. And I wondered if you would talk a little bit about that friendship and what it meant to you, not just your career, but personally over the yeah. years. I think about Sue every day. I can, I, oh, I, wow. I can tell you um, what, a, you know, I have to say what a class act, what a, what a charming, hilarious, authentic, genuine, friendly, hardworking, determined, hilarious. I mean, if I reach around my computer right now, let me see if I can do this. If I reach around my computer right now, this is this is the bottle of wine she gave me. Aww. With M is with the M is for murder tag on it. Um, and I and of course I couldn't drink it. I just save it and I use it um, just as um, as inspiration. We mm -hmm. we met because I asked her, oh my golly, this is so funny. Talk about JT and me together. This is, this, we couldn't have more connections. I used to do the, uh, the author interview show for Channel 7. Um, and years before, ah. I wrote, and years before I started writing, Sue Grafton was one of the guests that I interviewed. And I had not written a book. I had not written a word. And I said to her in this interview, you know, I've always wanted to write a mystery. You know, since I was a little girl, I've wanted to write a mystery. And she says, well, you know, when you write it, you just send it to me and I will look at it. So, I, you know, because, of course, I'm, that's never going to happen. So like nine years later, I wrote her this letter and I said, um, this is your good deeds come back to haunt you. <laughs> a million years ago when you said if I wrote a book, you'd read it well. Here it is. Um, and she wrote back and she said, I'll read your book, but if I don't like it, you'll never hear from me again. So don't write to me anymore. And wow. maybe a month later came wow. a letter from Sue, which is on my wall behind me framed with the blurb from the book. We were dear friends since then. I mean, laughing and one of the best pictures, one of my favorite pictures ever is, and I'll tell you one more thing about it. Um, is her coming up to me, somebody snapped a picture of her coming up to me with my book and asking me to sign my book to her. And I just burst Aww. out and it was too crafted wow. and me to sign that's amazing. Stuff. And that's how wonderful, that's how wonderful she was. You know, yeah, but you know, 
she was so genuine. She would yeah. not, she would not fake it. No. And so yeah. if it had not been the real thing. Yeah. I think you and I both know she would have been, she would have been polite and said, honey, <laughs> stick to TV. Well, I mean, how, yeah. how interesting is that, that she told me just, if you don't hear from me, it's not a mistake. Yeah. You know? Don't oh wow about that. That's just actually a really good answer mm -hmm. to somebody. I just it remember uh, this workshop I took with her. She read my manuscript. She read you could get a manuscript critique for I don't know fifty bucks. It was unbelievable. <laughs> and um, she read my first manuscript and she said, "Okay, what have you do? You know, you can get published. What are you doing?" Oh. And um, after yeah. that book, I um, I wrote it. And uh, my publisher, Harper Collins, said, well, we're going to ask so-and-so and so-and-so to blurb it as a favor to you. And I said, well, I thought I would ask Sue Grafton. <laughs> and they said, oh, no, honey, you're not asking. <laughs> <laughs> we're, not asking. we're not asking Sue Grafton. And I said, but you know what? After I got home from this workshop, I wrote her a note and thanked her for all her help. And she wrote me back. And I said, how about if I ask her? And she did. Oh, you too. That's who she was. If you had the goods, yeah. if you, you know, if she believed in you, she she would. And, you know, whenever she came to Atlanta, we would try to get together. What a role model, right? Yeah. And you would see her just throw back her head and laugh. I mean, she was so famous. Yeah. But, you know, she enjoyed it and she had, thought life was fun and she yeah. embraced it. Um, I think that the idea that she didn't get to Z with the book is about the most profoundly beautiful thing that there yeah. could ever be, you know, that the universe just left it as it was, just left that door open, you know, just yeah. brings tears to my eyes to think about, mm -hmm. to think about, it. It's, you know, shows you that there's some wisdom in the universe somehow. We don't yeah. really understand it. Wow. You guys make me wish I'd met her. Yeah. yeah. Me too. She was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Mary Kay, give us a quick reminder about our bookstore of the week. And yeah. then we'll you know, one of our founding principles was to support indie bookstores like Parnassus, one of my favorite places to visit in Nashville, founded and run by our beloved author, Ann Patchett. This week, they're offering 10% discount on books by our guests, as well as by the five of the FNF host authors. The code is Friends Fiction 10. Also, for anybody who pre orders The Forest of Vanishing Stars, Kristen's forthcoming book from Parnassus, <laughs> now and this Saturday, the 21st, Kristen will send you a Friends in Fiction koozie. Parnassus has a special page set up on their site, and we will have it up on our website to accept your pre orders. Awesome. That's awesome. That's okay. A wonderful cover. That is quite a, just a, it's a gorgeous cover. Yeah, I'm so happy with it. Yeah, you too. Okay, because we have been such chatty Cathy's, not just you, Kathy Trotek, but all of us have been <laughs> chatty Cathy's. We're gonna we're gonna skip right on down to the writing tips so that we don't run out of time. But I need to tell you, Hank and JT, you have loads of questions on the Facebook page. Oh. So if you have time, just run over there this week. And they're asking about your daily beast story, Hank, which I'm dying to hear about. They're yeah. asking about your friendship. They're asking about your name, where Hank came from. So we'd all love all those answers. But what we really want right now is your writing tips. So Hank, we talk a lot on here about writing tips, supporting other writers, and you're an amazing example of an author who's doing that. I know you're involved with the website careerauthors.com with one of my favorite people, Dana Isaacson. Oh, isn't he amazing? Isn't he amazing? He's okay. A, he's an editor, y'all. He's an editor and he is a genius. Uh, I've he's, never seen anybody. They call him the story whisperer. He's oh, amazing. Yeah. And so that y'all have a website called careerauthors.com, which offers amazing articles, writing prompts, all kinds of things. So tell me what our writing tip is from you. Well, Mary Kay brought up Sue Grafton. So let's go what I, with what I learned from Sue Grafton. We might oh, well the, keep it going, keep the history going. Um, Sue taught me two things. One is um, to every day, if you're writing, set your intent for the day that this is what you would intend to accomplish, accomplish in the words that you're writing. Mm -hmm. 
And, and that's sort of a roadmap for you to get that little chunk of, you know, is it the happily ever after ending? Is it when there's a big clue is set? Is it the big reversal? It's when the emotional hook is set. What is it that you're doing so you know? Ooh, um, she wow. also taught me, and this is so crazy, and I thought it was a terrible idea. She also taught me to keep a writing diary. Yes. So that every day at the beginning of when I write, I write down not long. I'm not, I'm not even talking about a paragraph, like a couple lines, just how I feel and to save them. And I have to tell you, they have saved my life because when, when I started writing the book that I'm writing right now, which is due like tomorrow, <laughs> I, I, wrote in, I wrote in my, in my writing diary on page what I write page, day one. I have no idea. <laughs> And then I thought, oh my golly, I have no idea. And then I went to the previous writing diary and it said, day one, I have no idea. And I thought, oh, well, this is how I always feel. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not yeah. just that this is the only time that I've ever thought that I can't do this and I have no idea what I'm doing. This is my process. This is my emotional yeah. process of fear yeah. coming first. And then I turn, I keep, you know, I turn the page of the old, turn the pages of the old diary. And there is, oh, I have a good idea. Oh, oh, I think this is going to work. Oh, crossing fingers oh, wow. now. That yeah. my progress is there. And my favorite line that I ever wrote in one of those diaries is, um, every New York Times best-selling novel started with one word. So just write one word. Love it. That's great. Dang, I'm bringing, bringing it, it home. home. Yeah, bringing it home. Well, Sue brought it home. Sue brings it home. But you brought it, you took it all the way. That's so what we're Jay, for, right? That's Jay, what we're here for. Yeah. JT, my friend, you have been part of my pandemic survival team. You are constant, I'm going to get kind of choked up. You are constantly sending out inspiring notes and yes. articles and tips and I wish everybody could see everything you've been sending out for the past six months. It's it's really been astounding. But can you share just one of your tips with our viewers? I think the most important thing, especially for female writers, is to respect your time. Uh, if you don't uh, respect your writing time, nobody else will respect it either. And if that means you have to, you know, mm. if you have to leave the house if you have to go to the library, if you've got a door that you can shut and say, this is my writing time. Mm -hmm. If you will respect your writing time, you will learn that the people around you start to respect it as well. And then that gives you the ability to do the thing that is the real writing tip, which is you've got to touch your manuscript every day. Mm -hmm. You don't have to write a thousand words a day. That's sometimes impossible. It's a great goal but it's hard to do, right? I mean, it's, it's a hard, hard thing, but it's very easy to open your manuscript and at least read what you wrote the day before. At least type a few lines, just try something, touch it every day. If you can't open the manuscript, open a notebook. If you can't do that, sit with it and, and think about it and just touch it every day, no matter what you're doing when you're building it and when you're writing it. And, and that just, it keeps you in it, it keeps you focused. And it makes it a lot easier when you sit down, you know, to do that page that yeah. he's talking about. The, I yeah. have no idea what this is. But if you've touched it the day before, you have a little bit of an idea. I mean, if yeah. you don't know, you sort of do. Um, yeah. So that that would be my my big thing. Respect your time and then touch the manuscript every day. Awesome. That's amazing. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. All right, we have a few announcements. We're gonna kind of try to pop through them. So Mary Kay, could you give us the first piece of huge news? Yes, we, Friends in Fiction, we are now on Instagram. <laughs> it's easy to find us under Friends in Fiction. We're gonna post writing tips and questions and first looks at covers and of course the inside scoop about our guests. Um, last night I posted um, pictures of me with my first books of advanced readers copies super exciting so make sure you go ahead and follow us on instagram at friends and fiction and christy um just a reminder to go ahead and pre-order the forest of vanishing vanishing stars yep vanishing stars. <laughs> <laughs> we, Thanks, yeah in my like defense, that 
We went through a lot of titles. A lot. Of we stuff. did. We did. You, you, like guys, a lot. you guys were like my title brainstorming team. So thank yeah. you. This so was, all of a sudden, I was like, wait. Yeah, that I is, wouldn't have a title. <laughs> for me, I was like dark. And then I was like, no, we decided not dark. Banishing. It's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> not <laughs> you. You. <laughs> um, so make sure that you pre-order at Parnassus. Um, and also, you're definitely going to want to pick up our amazing guests books from them tonight as well. Yeah. Mary Alice. Well, next week, we're very excited to host Sue Monk Kidd. Mm -hmm. And I've known Sue for a long time. She's a wonderful woman. And her book, The Book of Longings, is on everyone's TBR list. And we're really looking forward to it. So join us next Wednesday. And my dear Kristen. So I know we have been teasing you all with merchandise and we want to thank you for chiming in on our poll. So more news to come really, really soon. We promise. We know you're waiting for it. Um, and in the meantime, very soon, even sooner than the merchandise news, I think we're going to have some exciting announcements about being able to join a signed first editions club wow. for the five friends and fiction authors. So we'll have that to you, I think, within the next few days. Yep. So JT and Hank, Y'all are simply amazing. We could talk to you for another two hours. Your yeah. your advice, your stories. Um, thank there's you so many so questions. Much. I know. There's so, so many, many questions. questions. I have so, so many asking. questions. I know. <laughs> We're going to have to do a, 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 um, a backstory, like a second one behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, yeah. For sure. You, you both are amazing. Thank you so much for coming with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank it's great to be here. Great. Well, I hate so, bye. bye guys. So that's a wrap for this Wednesday night, and we yeah. will see y'all next week for Sue Monk Kid. That's a wrap. Thank Yay! you. Yay! That was awesome. They're so great. I really okay. Can I okay, wait. We had a lot that? of information, and we got through it. It was great. I want to ask a question. Job. Whoa, I was sweating. Good job, Patty. That, that was, was amazing. Really Great job. That was really good. I want to ask y'all a question, though, that has to do with JT's writing tip. So when she's talking about touching your manuscript every day, so like I'm editing right now, so I am not dealing with, like all I'm doing is editing. I am not looking manuscript. at my other manuscript. So like when you guys are we're like editing one book, are you also writing another one or are you just Never. editing? No, no, okay. you're touching your manuscript right now okay. with right. editing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, One thing at a time. Know, I, I can't, I can't do people, two at a time. Do yeah, some people can. I, I just, I don't want to. I think it makes no. for a confusion in your yeah. head about where you're focused. Yeah. Okay. So, just making sure. Just making so sure. I, I, I read. Go ahead, no, there's a question okay. about her name, um, Hank. Someone said we should ask about. Does anyone know the answer about the name Hank? I know. Okay, we'll have to find out if she answers it yeah. online. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Christy, I just, th I think if you're working on your manuscript, you're working on your manuscript and some days you're going back and you're doing revisions and some days you're doing copy edits. That's working yeah. on, your, that's touching your manuscript. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I can't, yeah. I am not one of these people who can work on two different writing yeah. projects at the same time. I know there yeah. are writers who do that. Yeah. And they can compartmentalize their books, but when I'm in a book, my brain, it my yeah. my, I am in the world of that book. And for me to yeah. to try to um, go to another project, I feel like, who are those people? I can't. I don't know those people yet. Yeah. Right. I agree. I I can do it when I'm in copy edits because I think copy edits like you, you don't need yeah. to be you don't need to be creating anymore. Right. Like you you, yeah. you almost have to take a step back from the book and stop looking at the characters and look more at the details yeah. at that point. And I think that's when I can move forward to the next one, but not before then. Yeah. Yeah. So speaking of our guest, JT, like I said, was part of my mm -hmm. um, pandemic survival team. <laughs> and one of the books she told me about that just saved me was this book called Deep Work by Cal Newton, Cal. But yeah. it talks about that exactly, Christy, which is this idea that we we have only so much deep work we can do, right? Yeah. And if we're trying to scatter it around, none of it gets done well. So I try to remember that. And, and I think Hank talked about it tonight. Like I do this and then I do this and then I do this. Yeah. We can't dive deep if we're like, bing, 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 yeah, bing. True. So, 
I not love when she talked about the writing intent, like to sit down, yeah. because I know what I quote have to do that day, right. but an intent is a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Was, no. Yeah. When I took that writing workshop with Sue Grafton, she was so generous. She shared, I mean, she was super organized. So she shared pages from her daily writing journal. Oh, wow. And it would be, I mean, wow, she, she, she was very organized. And, and um, so she would get up in the morning and she would meditate. And then she would, in her journal, talk about what do I need to do today with the book? Who, uh, and she would say, what happens? I need to mm. get Kinsey Milhone was her, her protagonist. Well, Kinsey needs to, you know, meet the suspect or um, this needs to happen and that need to, needs to happen. And um, I learned so that workshop, I can't even tell you how valuable it was to me, but she talked about that. And so like I have my, my little composition book and lots of times I start yeah. working out what happens today, what happens in the world of the book today. And sometimes it's, it's as simple as saying, well, um, Ivy talk to the real estate agent. And sometimes it's um, more complicated, like I have to get, you know, this person has to die today. <laughs> and then, and then sometimes it's as simple as, well, I need to do some research because I don't know yeah. what happens, you know, when there's a car fire or whatever. And, um, and then goal setting. She was, Sue was big on goal setting. Yeah. Yeah. What's the book or for your individual days? Not just her. No, she would talk about what is your one year goal? I mean, she was, oh. beginning, she was teaching a beginning writers workshop. So it would be like, what is your work? One work. What is your one year goal? Mm. So for most of it, it, it was finishing a book. Yeah. What is your two year goal? It's like, maybe it's getting your book public. And five years, and um, and somewhere I, I, I've got to dig that up. I have the notebook where I wrote my goals out. Wow. I'd love to see it. Yeah. I'd love I, to see it. I, I do that every year, and it's really, and I do it every month, but I do it every year, and it's really fun to go back and look at like 2013 and see, like, because wow. you know, sometimes you forget like where you were and yeah. where you are in such a short amount of time. And I mean, I can look back and in 2013, I was starting to write my first manuscript, you know? Oh so it's gosh. amazing to think like how it mm -hmm. seems like it's been a long time, but it really hasn't. But I love the idea of that, but especially with your writing, I've never thought about sitting down and thinking like, what's my goal today with my writing? I don't do that. So I love, I love yeah, it. yeah, yeah. I feel like we, we started this because we were all, you know, like, what are we going to do? And <laughs> And I'm learning so much from yeah. these other authors. What JT yeah. and Hank yeah. just talked about, um, I'd never heard said in that way. I mean, I scribble in my notebook every morning, but because I believe in morning pages, it's the artist's way. But I've never thought about using it for what about my story? Yeah. So, wow, I thought it was amazing. Yeah, I did too. Good, sure. really good. Uh, now, speaking of writing, I have hours to go before I sleep on my review. <laughs> okay. yeah. No way. I don't know how you work at night. No, me neither. I'm I, I don't know how she works like 20 hours a day for <laughs> amazing. I know. You know I don't know. It's, no, I don't recommend it. <laughs> we can't do this. We can't do this again. <laughs> No way. No, this is it. I promise. No, I don't. You're still I'll, I'll probably still do it. <laughs> Not y'all. I'm, I'm gonna go eat my soup. Uh, this sounds delicious. I love y'all. Bye. 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 Bye